Uh, welcome everyone to the next session for the Community Partnerships and Action stream. Uh, and we have an online speaker for this uh, session. The name of the talk is The Tree With No Name and Sue and Bob Durant from North East Albert Landcare will be presenting now. Let me hand over to them. Thank you. Hi hey everyone, we are indeed Bob and Sue from North East Albert Landcare. Um, we're a small landcare group which is based in the northern Gold Coast in the Darlington Range, which uh, extends more or less north from Mount Tambourine, if anyone knows where that is. Um, and we're, we're focusing today on how we've gone about uh, undertaking some pretty significant restoration work in the Ormo Valley, which has the Pimpama River running through the middle of it, and particularly focusing on a tree called the Ormo Bottle Tree. For anyone who doesn't know about the Ormo Bottle Tree, it's a type of brachychiton. Um, it's very, very rare. It's probably right up there with the Woolamite Pine in terms of um, uh, awareness. Um, it was first discovered to be a, a species all on its own around about 25 years ago or thereabouts by someone called Janet Hauser. And it only occurs naturally in the Ormo Valley. So the area to which it's endemic is, is absolutely tiny. Um, and when it was first looked at to try and quantify just how many trees there were back in 2009, the first count was made. And we'd only find 140 mature specimens, that was, uh, that was it. And it actually hasn't got much bigger than that since then. Um, it became listed as critically endangered in 2013. And as I mentioned, it was discovered by someone called Janet Hauser and she really discovered it a bit by accident. The tree that um, they first identified is right beside the road that runs through the Ormo Valley, Upper Ormo Road. And people used to think that it was a mango tree because when a uh, Ormo bottle tree has its mature leaves and it's got some age, so it's got a, a, an old trunk, they can look remarkably like a mango tree. But anyway, just by chance, Janet, who was a, um, a local amateur botanist and botanical artist um, identified the fact that it was a, a different tree. Then there was some genetic work undertaken on it subsequent to that. And it turned out that yes, indeed, it is the Ormo bottle tree, or as it's known, Brachychiton species Ormo, because it hasn't been given a, a proper name yet. That's uh, thus why it's called uh, the tree with no name. So it's a um, very, very rare tree. It only occurs naturally in a tiny, weeny little part of the world in the Ormo Valley. And um, it's critically endangered, and that's why we've been um, working to try and uh, look after it and look after our entire uh, catchment area, if you like. Our vision has always been to try to establish or re-establish a continue, uh, continuous biodiversity and wildlife corridor from the Darlington Range out to Morton Bay. And if you look at the photograph there on the screen at the moment, that's taken from a part of the Darlington Range in an area that is revegetating with rainforest at the moment and looking out over more of the Darlington Range than the uh, sugarcane fields. And you can just see a little bit of Morton Bay and Stradbroke Island there, just to give you an idea of where we're talking about. So a lot of the work that we've undertaken as a land care group has been trying to re-establish that corridor. And a lot of that has been reconnecting a lot of little fragments which were left behind after practices from the past. So the area was first um, started to be used by white settlers way back in 1860 and it was officially surveyed in 1871. So there's been logging and agriculture happening there for quite a long time with uh, extractive industries coming along uh, quite a bit later, probably 30 or 40 years ago when extractive industry started to, uh, to operate in the valley. Now, as agriculture changed and as economics changed, some of the um, agricultural pursuits became less economically viable and 
So there were areas of land, uh, particularly the riparian area of the Pimpama River, that was largely left to itself and to invasive weeds. So just to give you an idea, this uh, photograph here is a juvenile Ormo bottle tree. You can see the distinct bottle tree leaf poking out down at the bottom there. And it's just starting to be overtaken by an exotic glycine vine, which unfortunately is really prevalent where we live in our valley. Um, left to its own devices, that tree will be dead within 12 months from being absolutely smothered and killed by that glycine vine. Just to give you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of weeds and their effect on the Ormo bottle tree. This might um, help to give you a little bit of perspective of what we're talking about. This is our catchment area taken, as you can see, in 1973 from an aeroplane. And this is the Pimpama River here, running all the way up to its headwaters up here. That's the Pacific Highway, or M1, that you can see there. It's pretty much in the same place as it was back then. As you can see, there's been wholesale clearing um, and particularly all around the riparian zone and running right up into the hills where some of the uh, prime habitat for the Ormo bottle tree exists. So what we came to back in the early 90s and the people in our land care group before us who started in 1992 was not too different to this that you're looking at here. So a lot of clearing, um, a lot of degradation of riparian areas. And even though these areas here look to be really well timbered, they've been fairly well logged. So where did we start to try and make it better? Well, in um, 1992 or 93, this person here standing beside the sign, that's Janet Hauser, the person who first discovered the Ormo bottle tree and brought it to prominence. And she got the idea that we should actually try to do some work with the local quarry. Now, a lot of people normally think that a quarry is, is your enemy. Um, in our case, where we live, they've actually been very, very helpful. Because they own a large tract of the Pimpama River frontage on both sides of the creek in some places. And so the thought was, what if we could get them to uh, be interested in um, undertaking some restorative work and eventually they came to the party. So um, the company at the time, and it's now since been taken over for many years by Borrow Resources, we worked very, very closely with them to clear the area and that large machine there <laughs> is what Borrell used to clear some of the area. That's how overrun um, and inhospitable it was with weeds. You just literally couldn't get into it. So that initial partnership with the quarry and the council has led to more or less a 30-year partnership. It's still going on now. Um, this photograph over here gives you a little bit of an idea, a little bit of a flavour of what some of the creek in the Borrell area looks like now. And even though you can't see them, up here there's three or four bottle trees of various ages, one very old mature one, which were previously utterly swamped with uh, all kinds of weeds and lantana and glycine vine and you name it, it was there. Um, but these days this is a better representation of what the creek looks like there. So, Working together, how did we do it with uh, engaging other partners? The quarry was a, a key stakeholder for us, but we also needed to engage private landholders, um, obviously the local community to be, you know, operate um, effectively as a workforce, I guess. And um, importantly, uh, various levels of government who've been uh, able to provide us with funding from time to time. And through particularly engaging with the private landholders, we've been able to um, uh, reconnect those fragments in between areas that the uh, part of which the councils looked after and part of which the quarry and others look after. So some, of the, some of the initiatives that have come out of that is uh, in the middle there, you can see here, that's, that's a, house which uh, Borrell Resources has made available to our land care group on a permanent basis to be a base for land care. We've been there for about eight years now. That's that's really great. Um, and the 
down here is just to give you a bit of an idea of, of uh, once we've done the initial clearing on some of the quarry site, and this is a very big site, it goes a long way up and down the creek. Um, when we did some early planting, that used to be a concrete batching plant, so it was absolutely, totally and utterly degraded. And um, uh, now, moving forward like 15, 20 years, this is all um, a, a beautiful piece of natural riparian bushland now. It's really good. So the other ways in which it's been great to have that ongoing partnership with the quarry is that they provide us with a small amount of money each year to undertake work off site. So we can choose anywhere up and down the Pimpama River that we uh, want to do some work and um, they fund it. Now, so, Photo down here where you can see these bollards and the road that's up on my road. Here is actually more or less almost like a miniature park and across the road or across the creek there is a large council conservation area. Now, we were able to get um, from Oral to uh, put up these bollards and put in a fence and undertake some weed control because the area was getting overrun with uh, four wheel drives and vandals cutting down trees and that kind of stuff. When we had a local botanist called Glenn Leeper do a survey there before we did that work in just a couple of hundred metres of the creek there, Glenn identified over 62, I think, rainforest species re-emerging there. So that and being across the creek from the large council conservation area made it a strategically very important little piece of creek to continue the, uh, conti uh, putting the mosaic of pieces together going down from the range to the bay. In an idea of what's been happening since 1973, these um, large green areas here are all conservation zones bought by the Gold Coast City Council over the last few years and are now permanently preserved and locked up for conservation. So back to that photograph I showed you from 1973, here's the Pacific Highway, and there's now conservation zones all the way from out here, east of the highway, running all the way up to here. Then that meets areas that we've done as land care, riparian zone back together, and meets up again with um, further large council conservation zones. So it's been very important, particularly in this area here, which is where the initial population of mature um, all my bottle trees was located and that's now um, wrapped up safely as a council conservation area. In addition, that's the Borrell Quarry site you can see there. Now, if you move up to here, Oral also own a large tract of land in here, which they permanently set aside as a koala conservation area. But importantly, it's also where another population, not a big population, but a population of mature Ormo bottle trees exists. So in working with them and others, uh, we've now got them doing a um, ongoing program of uh, weed control and fire hazard reduction through there to protect the bottle trees that are there and to allow uh, some um, germination of, of new, uh, new bottle trees, hopefully. And that's all been great. Uh, we've been very happy with, with what we've done in uh, putting together the corridor, the biodiversity corridor down the length of the Pimpin River, and that's been great. And it's certainly done a lot to help sustain the existing bottle trees and to um, provide a suitable habitat to allow other bottle trees to come forth. But um, you've got to keep things moving forward and we've put a lot of effort over quite a few years now into working with a number of local schools to get kids engaged in the environmental movement broadly and um, specifically um, to appreciate riparian zones and the almost bottle tree. So, this photo here is a, a planting on the Albert River that we've worked with Rivermount College on doing for probably 15 years now. It's been flattened a couple of times by floods, but as you can see, it's quite resilient. It's looking pretty good. That's a reasonably recent photo. 
And there's three or four or five almost bottle trees along there, which are doing quite well. And at Norfolk Village Primary School up here, you can see these couple of students that Sue planted, uh, I think three or four bottle trees with them recently. That's a, a spindly little juvenile species that you're looking at just there, which once again, you can see has got its typical um, brachychitin leaf that looks like a, um, a brachychitin rupestris leaf. But once it grows to maturity, it completely and utterly changes and has a leaf, a single leaf that looks very, very much just like a, um, a mango tree, which is why people used to think they were mango trees. So um, just to sum it all up, um, three messages to leave you with, think big. That's what Janet Hauser did back in 1992 and 93 when she first got the idea of engaging with the quarry and trying to get the council interested in taking on what was a very, very, very heavily degraded area, um, being the Pimpama River riparian zone. And I don't think even Janet probably thought that 30 years later it would still be going strong and it would still be doing great things for the Ormo bottle tree. This is um, this photo here is, is three local kids on uh, a large old bottle tree, which is right beside the Pimpama River on Borrell's land. That's part of the early area that we first revegetated. Um, you go back 30 years, you literally could not see that bottle tree for weeds. Explore all options. Um, as I said earlier, as a lot of people think um, a quarry is probably the last thing that they would want to work with as environmentalists, but um, there have been a lot of benefits to the environment and to us in doing what we've done going down that path. So I would encourage people to explore all options and certainly think ahead. Kids are the future and we need to get them engaged. So thank you very much for listening. And could we just mention just one last thing. Anyone who's interested in uh, further information on the bottle tree, if they go to this link, um, naturapacific.com, and look at their Back from the Brink series, you'll see that there is a um, video specifically on the Ormo bottle tree. It's very interesting. It's got a lot more information in it. So thank you. Thanks very much, Bob and Sue. That's a great presentation. Uh, we now have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has questions. Uh, it's Ella from Katanning in Western Australia here. Um, thank you for your presentation and a big congratulations to you and all your group. You've achieved some amazing stuff there. It was really great to see. Um, I have a question just about that original tree that was the one on the side of the road that everyone thought it was a mango tree. Um, no. When it became known that it was something a little more special than a mango tree, often when something goes from the obscure to the interesting, it can go either one of two ways. People can become very interested and passionate about it or people can be idiots and vandalise or things like that. Having one so prominent and so special, how has have you been able to use that for good? How has the community reacted to that, that really visible one? Um, it, has been, it has been both good and bad. Um, it's actually on private property, even though it's beside the road. Um, uh, but there are quite large branches that overhang out past the fence. And in years gone by, they fruit very, very sporadically. And no one really knows why yet. But um, uh, that big one that we're talking about, it's gone 12 years in between fruiting. And when it has fruited, people have come and just gone absolutely crazy in stealing seed, which has been really, really unfortunate. Uh, it's also known locally as the Energex tree because just after, just after it got its um, critically endangered listing back in 2013, I was driving down uh, the road to go to work one morning and there was a troop of guys working for Energex and they were busily hacking into it with chainsaws. And I pulled up and said, gosh, you can't do that. And it's extremely rare tree and it's protected, it's critically endangered. And they said, oh, don't worry, we won't hurt it. And uh, they cut about half the, <laughs> half the canopy out of it. And it has survived and it's put on some new growth. But in that way, it's been bad. In a, in a good way, it has provided a lot of people to be able to see what an Ormo bottle tree is 
and to then compare it to the more Jupiter level form and uh, go through the process of how it turns from one thing into the other and also to gain a bit of an appreciation of the kind of habitat that they require. And where that one is, um, there was quite a lot of weed growth all the way around it, uh, stopping anything much further from germinating, be it a bottle tree or anything else. And so it's also been a really, really handy and easy place to take people to educate them on um, on the importance of weed control um, to allow native stuff to come back. And the, um, we have an environmental centre over at Jacob's Well, which isn't all that far from us, the Jacob's Well Environment Centre. It's operated by the Queensland Department of Education and they quite frequently bring busloads of children out to our valley to look at all kinds of different things. but. Um, stopping and being able to tell them all about that tree and the importance of, of creating the right kind of habitat for it to thrive and to regenerate has been very handy. So it's been both good and bad. And if I could, I could just add on, um, I think particularly in the early years, um, most people did try to keep the locations of the bottle trees secret um, for that very reason that we didn't want them to be um, vandalised. Um, and I think that was probably good because it has enabled us to learn a lot more about their preferred habitat, a lot more about how they recruit and where juveniles might be found. So. You know, now the tree is becoming more famous and more people are learning about it, which is wonderful. And, you know, we've also been trying to um, get the tree located outside of the valley just to protect it in the longer term should a devastating fire come through as has happened in the past. I think, I think um, I'll just... Um uh, mention a comment online from our online audience and uh, that'll have to be the last question because we're out of time. Uh, terrific presentation. Thanks Bob and Sue. Great to see the large companies like Borrell get on board uh, with projects like this. Best of luck moving forward. That's from Simon Stewart. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is George Savika, so I'm calling, I'm from the Torres Strait. How important it is to have images from back then to now, and I know it may be for reporting it, uh, for incidents, but you use that for educational wise, like for the schools and for younger generations? Yeah. Look, it, it is really important, and I wish that way back then we'd taken a whole lot more photographs than we did because it, it's, it's a, such a handy tool for education purposes. Um, we've got some photographs from back then, but, but not anywhere near as many as I wish we did have. I'm afraid we're out of time and just like to thank Bob and Sue for a wonderful presentation and I hope one one day I get to see those bottle trees myself. <laughs> yeah.